So tonight we're going to be hearing from uh, our two um, speakers, our two panelists, Associate Professor Nicole Hartley and Lisa Jenkins from KPMG. And I want to thank KPMG for actually doing these events together with us. It's a great partnership that we've evolved over years, a very exciting partnership. Let me start by introducing Nicole, and then I'm going to introduce Lisa, and then I'm going to hand it up uh, over to our panelists to actually give their presentations. We're then going to do a Q&A after that, and uh, I'm going to take questions here in the audience, and the people online will be able to post questions, and I have been promised that I've got access to their questions through an iPad here, and to be able to see what they're actually asking. Let me start with Nicole. Dr. Nicole Hartley is a research academic at the University of Queensland Business School. Nicole's career research interests include service technology, virtualized services, customer brand relationships, message framing, new media, and service innovation. Nicole's current research agenda focuses upon exploring customer perceptions of the advent of technology and various forms of disruption in the delivery of services. This research is currently focused within the education, tourism, and health industries. Nicole is also the program lead, uh, director of our highly ranked MBA program at UQ. Welcome, Nicole. And going from the director of the MBA to, to an alumnus of our MBA program, I understand, uh, to Lisa Jenkins. Um, it's, it's a director in KPMG's digital data practice in Queensland. Lisa works with a range of clients in both the private and public sectors to formulate strategies that reimagine organizations, harness innovation from the fourth industrial revolution, action insights from trusted data, and help organizations to become more adaptive and thrive as connected enterprises. Lisa is passionate about leveraging emerging technology, data, and human insights to commercialize new digital and data-enabled products services and business models to deliver new value propositions for her clients, clients, customers. She's experienced in the development and execution of innovation, digital and data strategies, and commercialization approaches using agile and human-centered design techniques. Welcome, Lisa. <laughs> Click. Click. Can somebody click for me? <laughs> yes. So we'll start off with Nicole. Nicole, over to you, please. <laughs> Just getting set up, making sure. Can everyone hear me? I'm going to use my teacher voice. That's exciting, isn't it? Excellent. Good. It is wonderful to see so many people in the room at the same time. I'm just so excited every time I see people. It's great. Um, it's wonderful that you could be here in person. Sorry, everyone online, you're missing out. Um, but it's wonderful to have you online at the same time. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, before I dive into tonight's topic, I also wanted to pay my respects and acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands in which we meet. And tonight, where we're standing here at 293 Queen Street, so that's a, the Yagara and Turrbal people, and they've been custodians of this land here for about 60,000 years. So I pay my respects to their elders and particularly their leaders, those that are past, present, and those that are emerging and hopefully emerging with us at the business school. Um, COVID-19, um, responsible for so much death and so much uncertainty, but yet an accelerant for, ch for change. Um, the pandemic has no doubt advanced our place in the digital revolution. Um, with the adoption of digital technologies, um, I've read somewhere recently that digital technologies such as AI, uh, machine learning, et cetera, they're being advanced by three to seven years just over the last couple of months. So if we think about we were right smack bang in the middle of the digital revolution, if you didn't know that beforehand, um, and now we are pretty much advancing towards the end. Um, so the pandemic has really thrusted the adoption of digital technologies and, um, our, and digital processes really into overdrive. And it's really forced the issue with organisations that were, were not really profay in this kind of space. They weren't, they weren't thinking about it. It wasn't on their immediate agenda. So, you know, we've seen the big push for online um, shopping. We've seen in education now that most of our courses are being run in the streamlined or hybrid approach where we've got people in the classroom as well as being online. 
And in the healthcare centre where a lot of my work is focused, um, there is a lot of research, I mean, so, and I do a lot of research in the uptake of technology in that space. And we're finally even seeing the adoption of some technologies that have been around for a very long time, such as telehealth, Huzzah, now they're finally being picked up by a global market, which is fantastic because we're able to reach people en masse now with the healthcare that they need. So the new ways in which um, technology are being leveraged um, has, and utilised, it's meant there's been dramatic increases in the digital projects that we see within organisations and the scalability of these projects. Um, and this is the like that we've not seen before across all different types of industries. Um, and this has really been necessary because there's been such a competitive market around getting in front of people, keeping up the pace of other, of other competitors who are moving in this space and being quite agile in this space. And data plays a very pivotal role in advancing the way that businesses and the way that individuals and the way that ecosystems actually provide value to customers and other stakeholders. By way of exemplifying this um, and the fact that data has now become the new oil, such a great phrase, isn't it? I'm sure we've all heard it, okay? Not sure if I like it, but I might use it again while we're here. Um, by way of exemplifying this, I'll talk about a couple of healthcare projects that I've, I've worked on, and I can't give away too many trade secrets on them, but I'll give you some insights into how data can be so valuable, even in a space where we're not directly assigning a monetary value to something that we're exchanging. Okay, our lives are not a monetary exchange value. Um, our well-being is not a monetary exchange value, but there is value in healthcare. So medical data has been used by healthcare practitioners. It's used by academics um, to improve our, our population, population's health. And we do that at a, an individual level and we do that at an aggregate level, obviously, across populations. So health data has been considered a valuable commodity. Um, it has the ability to diagnose, it has the ability to treat, it has the ability to monitor, to cure people and to really increase people's wellbeing. And we do a lot of this health research um, looking at how technology can be used in this space and technology collects data. And it's one of the, the most di dynamic ways in which we can collect healthcare data. Now, there's a lot of sexy, fun things happening in the health space in terms of how we're collecting data, biometrics, et cetera. But at the core of it, not a lot of that is happening everywhere. We are collecting data in little funnels and little silos of projects that we're all individually working on. So this is a project that if I strip it down and say, this is actually how data is captured. Um, in a recent study I was involved in, we were interested in understanding how the physical activity of children with cystic fibrosis can actually increase, um, or can actually have benefits to their condition. And we all understand that the more that these children actually are physically active, the more that it actually is, is beneficial for the condition that they have. So in the study, we were interested in, in moving them away from having to be in healthcare, okay, moving them away from having to be at doctor surgeries, about not, not being in hospital, but being at home with their family and managing their condition in, in that way. So in this particular study, we were looking at collecting their heart rate data through Fitbits that we got them to wear at home so we can see how much physical act activity they were actually involved in. So in this instance, heart rate data is actually the oil, there I go again, of this particular, of this particular um, study. So within the data capture, we were able to understand that, you know, see, we were able to monitor their physical activity and actually see that there was ways in which we could preemptively talk to them about increasing physical activity and do some preventative treatment with them. But that wasn't the real value in the data that we actually collected. The data, well, the data that we didn't count on in the study was the residual data that we collected. And I don't know whether any of you own a Fitbit, but Fitbit tracks everything that you do, right? So Fitbits actually were tracking the data of their sleeping patterns of, the, of, these, of these children. So what we started to recognize is that their sleeping patterns were being very much, when their sleeping patterns were being disrupted, we actually correlated that with them being up coughing all night, which meant that they were, their, their actual condition was deteriorating. Okay, so this was accidental data that we collected, but at the same time, it's probably one of the most powerful things that came out of this particular study in terms of understanding that, because when they're coughing at night, that means they actually are deteriorating. Physical health is just, is, is more of a preventative, let's, so it, it's a sustaining kind of thing you can do with a condition. When you're coughing or night, you're deteriorating. So understanding that, we were able to actually stop 
and, and layer up that data and say, okay, so this is actually, we're able to actually get you treatment before you actually fully deteriorate. We're able to also ensure that you're not going into hospital, okay, and overburdening systems and also not having the best experience yourself. So in this study alone, we can see that the data outcomes for individual patients, but also at that system level of the hospital is quite profound. The other example of this is that there was possibilities us for also to reuse the data and look at ways in which we might actually and push that into gamification in order to actually engage with, with um, rehabilitation programs that these kids could use at home. So it's creating more holistic um, areas of care out of a single study. Now that was a single study that had one purpose and we, and we leveled it up to pretty much a, a systems level, so to speak. And that's the power of value that we see, particularly I see in data that's coming out of the healthcare sector, but we can see it all in all organisations that data has power. Um, and in medical, in medical and health data, it's also considered vi um, valuable, not only to the healthcare practitioners themselves, but also to other people involved in the sector or associated with the sector, so whether we like it or not, such as insurance companies, um, pharmaceutical companies, uh, technology giants, and, and, and particularly governments as well. Great value in data. Why don't we see data listed on our ledgers within our organisations as an asset? Because if we see the value in data, why isn't it listed there? And Lisa, as an accountant, is going to ask me a lot of questions about this, and I'm going to avoid it in a minute. Um, anyway, um, but in line with, but we see other intangible assets listed on our ledgers at the same time. We see things such as, you know, brand equity is actually listed on, on, a, on a ledger in terms of an intangible asset put forward. We see patents listed on an asset registered moving forward. Um, we also see a whole lot of other things that are associated with other capital that we have on there, such as salaries and wages. That's an indication of our human capital, et cetera. But yet we rarely see digital registers within um, um, which showing data as a strategic asset. And that's mainly because most organisations aren't managing, they're not managing their data well, okay? And they're not thinking about it strategically. Because if you think about how most organisations go about data, and I'm not blaming organisations for this because we evolve as we evolve, but we've evolved into silos. It's like a university, we're in a lot of silos, okay? So just saying. Um, you, get the, you get the gist. Um, so for the past few decades, as we've evolved data, we've evolved our own data silos. So me as a researcher, I sit within my own data silos of the research that I have exposure to or the data that I have exposure to within organisations you have digital, even digital initiatives where you're siloing them within your organisations. Um, and so the repurpose, the reuse, the levelling up of data and then being able to actually assign a tag to it as a strategic asset is much more difficult when we're dealing with digital silos. Um, and we really need to start realising the enterprise level way of looking at data and seeing it as that strategic asset that it deserves to be. So how do we go about this? Um, glad you asked, everybody. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to be interactive. Um, right. So how do, we, how do we do this? Well, we've got to strip it back first and look at how data operates within an organisation. How does it become the oil within an organisation? And I think it, well, a way that we've tackled it with the work I've been doing with some researchers, both here um, in Singapore as well as the United States, is looking at data as a, in life cycle stages, okay? It helps you break it down and simplify it, okay? So first of all, and I'll apply this to a healthcare context because I'm gonna keep up that theme, is first the creation, okay? So how do we capture data? So we can capture data in healthcare through observations, through biometrics, um, through um, health, other different types of healthcare technology that we have out there. And we can also integrate this data with other third party data, such as data, fr data from Medicare and other healthcare agencies. Data then flows through and we utilise that data to build digital assets. Okay, so digital assets are the synthesization of the, the, that data to make a diagnosis, to actually treat a patient with a, with a condition, okay? The third stage, and this is where it always gets a bit fuzzy because data is always thought about, okay, we're gonna capture data, we're gonna use data, okay? And next one is like, how do we refine that data? What else can we use that data for? What is it strategically important for? How do we maybe um, dissect that data, data further? How do we refine it and make more nuanced insights or more high level insights out of the data that we have? And the final thing there is the actual retainment. 
Um, we did a whole lot of we did a whole lot of interviews with different people from large corporations that deal with a lot of data. And this was one of the stages that a lot of people stumbled over. It was like, oh, retirement of data. Uh, I don't know. It sits in a data lake somewhere. I'm not sure what we do with that. And it's the same. Like we're always giving over all this data. Where does that data end up? And particularly with patient data, where do we keep this patient data? And who, and who ha ha has access to it? So we can see from this diagram though that you know data flows, it should flow around these things like oil through a company, okay? Um, but each of these phases also brings with it um, risks, okay? So risks that um, are aligned to lots of things that we see in the media, such as data breaches, consumer privacy, et cetera. And they can happen at all aspects of this data lifecycle chain. We want to mitigate as many of these risks as possible, obviously, because they have internal negative consequences to the way in which we are able to use data. But more importantly, they have negative consequences for the stakeholders, our important stakeholders that work with us. So we've done a little bit of work into this. I mean, we were looking at ways in which we could actually ascertain what is something that organisations could champion with, sorry, what, what is it that managers and even employees with organisations could champion to ensure that data is, is accepted as a strategic asset. And for something to be seen as a strategic asset, it needs to be, it needs to be, needs to be measuring on that bottom line and have reduced risk, okay? So no one wants to invest in something that's highly risky and data is risky. So how do we take or strip away that risk? And it's about engaging in what we call corporate digital responsibility, okay? So corporate digital responsibility is not unakin to corporate social responsibility in that it is looking at where it acknowledges a way in which an organisation should be treating a certain aspect of life. And this is how it should be treating data. It's, it's, it's encompassing all of the norms, the processes, et cetera, that companies should be looking at in order to actually deliver, to utilise their, their data well and to deliver good value for the stakeholders that they have both internally and externally. So what we're championing for here is for companies to become strong in their CDR, okay? Um, that CDR shouldn't be something that's nice to have. It should be something that organisations have, have as a must have within their organisations. Now, we understand at the same time that because data and the way that we manage data is so new, there's lots of trade-offs that organisations face when they're thinking about this. Um, and we investigated a lot of these different CDR risks that are involved in organisations. And we were really looking at what was motivating organisations to not necessarily be the super A-star CDR performer that you would want an organisation to ultimately be. And there is trade-offs in organisations. And we see, we actually looked at, at five different motivations that came through in the data that we were collecting um, from what we did. First, there is many gains to be made and short-term wins in sales, et cetera, for actually utilising data in certain ways that may be cross-selling, up-promoting, up all of these things. But they have practices, these are practices that may carry a gamut of privacy, fairness, discrimination and psychological risk to the people involved in those practices. Second, we know that companies actually are looking to enhance customer experience. And if you're not dealing with customers themselves, you're dealing with another business partner. So the experience that that business partner has, we're trying to offer personalization. We're trying to offer immediate access. We're trying to increase the speed of our service. All of these things have direct initial benefits to the stakeholders we're dealing with, particularly our customers. But each of these practices has negative CDR issues associated with it. And we see this time and time again in terms of coercion, privacy concerns, a lack of autonomy, et cetera. The third thing is that in a lot of the time, we our companies are actually investing in digital practice and automation in order to reduce costs, okay? And, 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 that's, and that's understandable. But at the same time, these carry risks such as lack of transparency and discrimination. Fourthly, some organisations are just reluctant to get on the bandwagon and actually discuss you know, data as, as the new oil or data as a digital asset. Um, and basically that comes down because they see no immediate returns. Okay? It's not actually appearing on their ledger. So where are the immediate returns I'm going to see in this sometimes massive investment that you'll see from what we propose shortly. Finally, also, there's just a lot, sometimes there's just poor CDR practices that are coming through based on the fact that a company just doesn't have awareness or they just have low commitment. Um, and that comes across all sectors. It's not just those that, that uh, don't have the cash flow to support them. 
So there is lots of tensions around this area, um, but we think it's strategically important for organisations to be looking at how they can create a very strong and resilient CDR culture um, and system within their organisations. Now, the work that we did also broadened out from this. We looked at the ways in which companies can actually build a strong organisation at interfacing with their customers, also interfacing with their value chains. But this is how internally some, some ideas around how an organisation might go about doing this. First, it's about building a strong CDR culture. And culture really comes down to actually understanding that there are norms and practices that the organisation stands by and that they're backing themselves around those practices. Now, that sounds easy to do, but we know culture shift is a pretty huge beast. Okay, but there's little things we can be doing to move in the right direction. Um, and it's really about ensuring that the company knows that there is ambigu ambiguity around data and how you use data. Like I might be approached from some other faculty to say, I'd like to understand how this student's been performing in your program, because they're also in our program. Am I able to give away that student's data? No. Okay, but if I'm, I'm convinced that, you know, well, this is for the benefit of the student, we can help them together to become, you know, a, a better learner, okay, and to enhance themselves. Where's the practice? Where's the ambiguity level here? And how does my organisation back me to say that's not appropriate? Let's go through the right channels and we can maybe work together in other ways to help the student. Supporting management. Uh, the other thing here is actually making, so making everything transparent within your organisation, but actually putting key KPIs around actually doing the right thing. We rarely do that. There's usually no reward for doing the right thing internally within an organisation. It's either just expected or no one asks you and then they don't want to know about it, okay? So, but about putting KPIs against these, that makes things transparent and accountable and the practice gets ingrained. Sporting management structures are all about actually looking at not only investing in at that strategic level, because lots of organisations are investing now in CTOs, CIOs, et cetera, that's great because that gives people who are looking at these types of issues a seat at the senior leadership table. And that's where this should strategically should sit, is that we'd love someone who is responsible for CDR to be sitting in the boardroom with everybody else helping make good decisions. Um, but it's also about ensuring that people who work in these teams are actually integrated across the organisation, ensuring that all your business analysts aren't just sitting in a business analyst, uh, you know, sort of a, a unit. There is no point in them being in that unit when they can't share their knowledge, they can't see what's going on on the ground, they can't see how they can actually help and build the value that actually builds the asset that you can put on your ledger at the end of the day. Um, and the last thing here is obviously digital governance. This is a must have, this is what most people are doing, so I won't harp on about this one, um, but it's really about formalising the practices around digital governance, um, ensuring that you don't have any grey areas, that everything is made expli explicit and that you actually have that across all of your units, that it's not just a unit kind of, it's not just the data analyst unit approach to how we do data, but everyone is considerant, considerant of data at the end of the day. Some CDR practices are no-brainers. Um, they're easy to implement and should be implemented really quickly, whereas others really do involve serious trade-offs. Um, so, you know, this spirit of change of actually understanding data as an asset, it won't be a, a quick fix. Um, but there's lots we can do in the practice of what we're doing. And I encourage each of you to go back to your organisation and think about ways in which you can start conversations. Think about how the data you're collecting on a daily basis within your organisation can be maybe shared with others and start sharing a culture because that's when we'll start getting buy-in at that strategic level. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to hand over now to Lisa Dinkinson, who from KPMG, and as a reminder, she's the director of the Digital Delta program there with KPMG. So lots of wonderful insights. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nicole. It's going to be a pretty hard act to follow. Um, you covered a lot of ground very quickly. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm really delighted to join you here this evening to talk to you about how organisations can realise value from their data. Um, and I'm going to start with uh, a key premise. The data is only valuable to the extent that it is consumed. And because it's really only when we consume data and information that we can derive insights to take action. And that's where the value in data really lies. But what I'm going to also say to you at the outset is that despite increasing efforts and significant investments by organisations over recent years, many organisations really aren't setting up for success when it comes to the way that they approach their data projects. 
to leverage data strategically and to be intelligently empowered anytime soon. And I'm sure each of you can relate um, to one degree or another that your organisations are trying to derive value from the data that they have right now. And it's by far a new concept. And I often speak to clients and uh, often they'll say, you know, we have so much data in our organisations, we don't know what to do with it, we don't know where to start. Um, we've got this project team over here uh, and we've in invested a lot in this platform, but our organisation is still not getting value out of that data. And we've got uh, business teams that are going around um, that project, um, doing their own reports, and still no one trusts the data. So organisations looking to derive value from the data and, and insights have long invested in analytic assets, from on-premise data warehouses to data lakes um, and to machine learning platforms, just to name a few. And whilst imp improvements in tech have lowered the barriers to entry, and this is why these projects are uh, and problems are probably really common in your organisations. What we're con constantly finding is that talking to org organisations across all sectors is that the journey to being insights driven is elusive and challenging. And there's lots of research that has gone into this, both by organisations like ours, as well as research bodies. And many of the factors aren't technical. Um, they include things such as driving culture change and optimising the right, the right operating model. But some of the factors are technical. And it's our view that some of the technical challenges can be alleviated by exploring a next generation insight architecture, an architecture that's designed and implemented differently to contemporary approaches. So tonight I want to expand on these challenges and introduce you to a relatively new concept, a new decentralized data architecture, first described by Zamak Dagani by Thought, at the ThoughtWorks in 2019 and it's referred to as a data mesh. So the question is, where do we start? Well, I'm going to start with this notion, um, which you've probably also heard before, about the need for organisations to build a single source of truth. And building a single source of truth is conventional wisdom and a well-accepted um, goal documented in most data strategies. And to be honest, it's in every data strategy that I've ever written. Um, and develop with my clients. Um, because after all, if there isn't a single source of truth, then we risk du duplicating effort, uh, increasing costs, and uh, feeling this general lack of trust in data and insights. So now I want you to think back to the early days of decision support systems um, and this approach of getting all the data together uh, in the one place um, for analysis because, and, and you know, it was feasible at that time because we're really only talking about ERP solutions and maybe a few other little um, systems around the traps, some spreadsheets, when we're really only talking about BI reporting and management reporting. Um, and so, you know, that was reasonable, um, reasonably manageable, we think. But as analytical approaches have matured, coupled with the in introduction of cloud, building that single source of truth has become increasingly challenging. And what we find is that users have varying degrees of tolerance for the truth and accuracy. And uh, there's other dimensions such as cost and time that come into play. So if you take in the context of a university, for instance, what is the definition of a full-time student? Um, does it mean that that student is enrolled full-time for three to four years? What if they defer for a semester? Uh, what if they're studying three subjects or four or two? Um, you know, our definition of a full-time student might depend on how we want to consume that data and from the perspective of who. So is it someone from student recruitment and enrolments? Is it someone from marketing? Is it someone from finance? Um, and, and that's just thinking about it in the context internal to that or to, to the university. Then you start thinking about parties external to the university like Centrelink. How do they want to interpret the definition of a full-time student? So, you know, those silos that Nicole spoke about in her presentation are real. Um, and then you've got to start thinking about of those different parties, how often do they want to consume those insights? So time, once again, comes into play. And so we're faced with this quandary of truth and accuracy, which means we're also then presented with a myriad of architectural challenges that follow. Um, and challenges that are really difficult to operate in this one source of truth or one platform to rule them all type construct. 
and it feels a bit like this in practice. And it really renders this one platform for the source of truth to be a, ch a challenging, dare I say, an unattainable target state. Why? Because data consumers have different tolerances for the veracity of data and the speed at which they want to consume those data and insights. So the question is, how do we think about this differently from a technical standpoint? So our architecture work is about choosing trade-offs. Um, there's no single insights platform that can service all use cases. And whilst there's lots of different architectural design patterns that can, that can coexist on a platform, experience tells us that a monolithic platform-centric architecture is only ever optimised for one or two use cases. So if you take on one hand the data lake, um, which is generally designed for ad hoc data discovery and data use cases, um, those, you know, the data lake is optimised for fast ingestion of data, making that data available as quickly as possible. But they're not really great, uh, not a great fit for real time integration or application of business rules to deliver repeatable, trusted management reporting. And then on the other hand, if you think about a data warehouse, useful, which is really useful for structured analysis of data, it really can't cope with real time streaming uh, of events and complex event processing. And so it goes that this platform, um, the monolithic platform architecture, choosing one platform to rule their, them all, regardless of whether it's a data lake or a data warehouse, really isn't setting up anyone for success. And I've been having a little bit of deja vu thinking about this. Um, if you go back to the path that we went, we went down the last 20 or 30 years, um, implementing big monolithic ERP systems, um, the solutions that promised the world, but really um, took quite a long time, um, particularly in the early days, to deliver any real value. And so building platforms that aim to serve um, everyone often lands us in a place where we've developed something that is so big and cumbersome and generic and general purpose in nature that it delivers value to no one. And I can't tell you a time where I worked in a, with a client and in the, their environment, they only had a single standardized system or platform architecture to run their entire organization. I can't recall that in the early part of my, my career. And I certainly can't think of a client right now, given the transition to cloud solutions. And as like Nicole mentioned earlier, um, many organizations contain data silos as a result of the functional silos that exist. They have their own repositories of data data processes and governance structures. And you know, so the, the, the challenge here is not a lack of investment in technology. The problem is the range of technology solutions that just aren't joined up in any coherent way. And it's that point that's really the basis of the Max theory that trying to build the same data lake or data warehouse type assets in the cloud is only ever gonna bring the same problems we had pre-cloud trying to build a single source of truth, a single monolithic platform to rule them all. So if you're an organisation that's been on the journey towards a single source of truth, it's probably um, likely that you've also started down the path of transitioning to a more centre enabled um, operating model for data and analytics. Um, and it's a model where the central team aims to um, build that single source of truth so that business teams can then analyze the data. But what we're now finding is even that model is starting to come into question, um, particularly as um, technology matures and in, that technology is becoming much more readily available to, to the average citizen. Um, and so it's due to a few reasons. So the number of technologies that make up an enterprise architecture has increased exponentially. Um, and so we've got this never ending barrage of data ingestion to be done but the central teams never catch up on ingesting the data, let alone producing any insights. And then secondly, it's easier than ever, ever before for the average citizen to access various types of technologies to analyze and visualize and crunch the data. And so how we're now seeing this play out in um, business teams is that the business teams um, are going around the central teams, resorting to their own data analytics practices using a myriad of self-service tools because they can generate insights faster than it would take if they waited for a single source of truth to be made available. So what does this all mean in practice? So, well, 
the way organisations are investing in data and data platform projects is, fa is falling significantly short in terms of the ROI, let alone delivering any quick wins. I'll go back to my first statement. So data is only of, um, valuable to the extent that it's consumed. And yet today we see organisations focus on ingesting data rather than serving data up for consumption. And as, was, as a result, what we're now seeing is this emergence of a new paradigm for how organisations can derive value from their data projects. So Zamak Dagani, she first explored the idea of constructing a distributed data domain data architecture supported by a product-centric approach um, back in 2019. And it's in our view that that article represents the first differentiated approach to delivering insights platforms designed in an attempt to overcome those traditional challenges and challenge conventional wisdom. So what is a data mesh? It's an architectural paradigm that unlocks value from data at scale. It's an, an approach that's intended to rapidly unlock access to an ever-growing number of distributed domain data sets for multiple data consumption scenarios, such as machine learning, analytics, and data intensive applications across the organization. And it's an architectural paradigm that's intended to address those common failure modes I spoke about uh, of the traditional centralized data platform architecture. And it's the convergence of these four things. So data, of course, distributed um, domain-driven architecture, self-service platform design, and product thinking. So in essence, in essence, it's about treating knowledge domains as the priority concern and leaving the implementa implementation details, such as the data lake tooling and pipeline, as a secondary consideration. The, the intent of this is really to shift our current mental models from a centralized data lake to an ecosystem of data products that play nicely together, the data mesh. And conceptually, the data lake and the data warehouse simply becomes another node on the mesh. It's about applying platform thinking to create self-service data infrastructure. And that means, means making sure that the platform is hidden, hides all the underlying technical complexity and provides that infrastructure and those components in a self-service style manner reducing the lead time to create a new data product. And importantly, it is about um, treating data as a product or an asset. So co-designing solutions with customers um, focused on really building those smaller units of insights. So to build on this in a little bit more detail, if you recall earlier, I, I discussed the idea that centralized data and insights platforms are akin to building these monolithic applications. They're slow, they're cumbersome, they're laden with architectural trade-offs that result in a suboptimal user experience um, for anyone trying to analyze data. On the other hand, a data mesh offers a distributed architecture that enables multiple teams to create data products supported by that self-service data infrastructure. And it's about progressively building um, small, manageable, fit for purpose, intelligent data products that are focused on answering um, an organization's most critical questions and aligning those to the needs of stakeholders or customers that perform part of the value chain. And then embedding those into a new operating model across people, process and technology to drive adoption. And adopting a data mesh approach requires that we establish product teams that focus on building domain specific data products that are provisioned independently and have distinct roadmaps. And if you know a little bit about my background, you'll appreciate why I'm a big fan of this approach. Co-designing solutions with customers, who would have thought? <laughs> um, and so this really enables for business teams with domain knowledge to build products, make those necessary trade-offs between truth and accuracy, um, both in terms of what we spoke earlier around um, choosing either a data lake or a data warehouse, but also in terms of the context in which people understand truth. Um, and you might recall my earlier comment where I spoke about how things are currently playing out in practice with business teams going around the central teams. Um, I think the reality is we actually need to embrace that and in doing so, recognise that we need a new operating model um, to evolve. And in, in that way, we need to um, enable so that the central teams are not spending all their time ingesting data. Um, 
it's a job that's never complete. We need to now get them to start thinking about how they can serve data through a, a set of domain-centric data products intended to be consumed by specific stakeholders or customers and treating data as a strategic asset. And the technical team success criteria is the provisioning on that self, of that self-serve data infrastructure and lowering the lead time um, for product teams to create those products. And I haven't even touched on some of the other benefits that this model um, brings in terms of the race for talent, talented uh, data cloud engineers. Um, in that model where infrastructure is provisioned, we can start using broader skill sets like software developers and business analysts to build the data products. So I think the architecture and the implied operating model is pretty uh, compelling. But what's the catch? Well, like all good things, there's a few new challenges to overcome. And we foresee three key challenges ahead. And the first relates to an organization's ability to enable data serving instead of data ingesting. So serving data across multiple operational and analytical systems requires a modern API fabric to be established. And that's a challenge for most organizations that are not digital natives um, and have a significant portion of the te technology um, still running on legacy ERP or worse yet mainframe. And then that challenge is also compounded by the fact that legacy systems often contain multiple domains within their systems. And then uncoupling all those legacy data stores requires that API layer to be constructed around those legacy core applications. But as organizations um, modernize their cloud operations to run on cloud native applications, we think that that challenge can be better managed. The second, second issue is working across data domains. So think about the, um, the silos that Nicole mentioned again. And whilst it's possible to de deconstruct data and insight solutions into products, discovering those products and analyzing multi -dom multiple domains across products is also challenging. And whilst a good place to start perhaps is how your organization is already structured. Um, for example, if you take a health context, we have delivery of frontline health and clinical services, we have procurement um, and supply, we have finance research. The challenge in a health organization managing its supplier domain data um, is really ever just analyzing the supply domain in itself. So if you think about the challenges that, that the health system has faced into over um, the last 12, 18 months around procurement and supply of clinical items um, through the pandemic, you know, if I don't get my PPE in time, it's not just a question of where my PPE supplies are and when are they going to arrive, but considering the flow on impacts of that in terms of the um, ability of my clinicians to safely deliver patient services, and if delayed deliveries results in reduced output, how does that impact my, um, my funding and my working capital? So how do we analyze data across multiple domains? And do we merge those domains to create a new product? Do we centralize domains together to create a central data store? And if we adopt a product-centric operating model, do we keep building these assets uh, or do we leverage existing assets, assets through a modern API fabric? The third issue is one of organizational capacity and capability required to sustain multiple data domain-centric teams that build and manage those products. And that requires a really high level of data literacy across the organization, as well as generally higher technical quotient to be able to manage domain-specific products over a long period of time. And so whilst it's getting easier for business teams to self-service their data, uh, constructing, constructing a whole of business domain-centric product structure is also going to be, remain challenging. But despite those challenges, we're pretty optimistic about the future of a data mesh. And my sense is that the challenge, um, challenges are likely to, re to reduce over time. Um, as technologies evolve and the general technical quotient increases. And the, the principles behind the data mesh really lay the foundations for a next generation insight architecture where we, where we adopt a new set of governing principles and a new language for deriving value from data. One where we focus on serving data rather than ingesting it, discovering and using over extracting and loading, publishing events as streams overflowing flowing data around those central um, pipelines and an ecosystem of data products over a centralized data platform. 
And with that, I'll leave you with this quote to ponder upon and thinking about how your organisation is currently going about trying to derive value from, from data. Are we repeating the past mistakes uh, in trying to build a single solution to solve for all use cases? Or do we need to think about another way? Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you very much to both our speakers who are now are going to be available for questions. I'm going to ask both of you to actually come here as, as panelists. Um, we heard in a very comprehensive fashion uh, about the return of investment on, on actually having data and the intricacies of, of, of dealing with that. So I'm pretty sure uh, there will be questions. We've got people with microphones uh, uh, going around so that we can, can take those questions in the room. I want to probably want to want to quickly uh, kick it off and, and ask the first question here. Um, if I if I distribute data over multiple depositories, and this is probably more uh, uh, linking into to your talk, Lisa, um, do I have to to take into account that the the accuracy of the data might not be the same as if I had a a central repository? And what I'm aiming with that, do I actually need to be tolerant? to do the accuracy of the data and deal with those inaccuracies? That's a great question, Michael. And I think that's what I was trying to convey was really um, people, what, what does truth mean to different people? So if you're coming at it from a perspective um, of, uh, you know, in the university example, enrolments, you really need to be accurate in terms of the, the numbers of, of people that you know are interested in a particular course. Um, but, but perhaps the question is, how many students do I have enrolled full time? And I, I want more of a generalist, you know, that it's, you don't need as much accuracy. And so I think this is why business teams are going around. And, and in the absence of having perfect data, they, they look for proxies. And proxies are sort of a demonstration about that difference in truth. Um, so it comes back to who, who was trying to consume that information and for what purpose? And this is where I think we end up in the quandary around putting data on the balance sheet because it's not meaningful until it's meaningful to someone. And how do you articulate that? Okay, yeah. excellent. Good, Let, let's open it up to the room. As we've got a question here in the front row, let's wait for the microphone. Hi, James Clark from Interrelison. I had a question around getting people on board to take on one of the data projects. I think about a typical project, you use the data to justify the doing of the project, whereas the project itself is the data and you don't know what you actually have until you get into it. What's the process of bringing stakeholders on board to um, commit, particularly where there's an investment in the project? I'm happy to, yeah, go ahead. I'm gonna kick that off. Um, I'll go back to my comment about how, you know, we go into organisations and they say they've got all this data and, that, and they are sort of confused about where to start. And we actually don't start with the data. We, we start with the, well, what are the strategic questions you need to answer? How are you measuring your performance right now? And using that to really focus in on um, how they're using their data to inform how they're tracking the decisions that they need to make. Uh, and that is one way to cut out the noise of all this data and, and get really specific. And then through that process, you can deliver value very quickly. Yeah, we had a question somewhere here and then the gentleman in the front. Hi, it's Phil Beresford here. I'm going to be a little bit sneaky and try and sneak in two. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll split it between the two. So um, the first one's for Nicole. You mentioned about um, data being recorded in the assets of the business, et cetera. Yeah. Um, how do you propose to value those assets? question. Um, <laughs> no, but that's exactly picking up on what Lisa was saying before. It is when you subscribe value to something, okay? So, and that value can be that the outcome of what we've actually learnt now, and I can prescribe it back to the, the example I gave with um, the cystic fibrosis case, was that the value at the end of the day was those parents didn't have to go through the stress of putting their children into, um, you know, so into hospital. So for them, that's, that's a non- you know, the, there's no value on your happiness and your well-being of your children. 
at a hospital level though, when you do that, the, the value is in the cost reduction of having to look after, and I know that's a terrible outcome of, you know, well, good, we don't have to look after another sick child, but that is their model of, of operatus. So you're actually delving into a cost factor there. So a lot of times it's not necessarily a cost value, it could be a cost reduction in a lot of cases, whether it's saving people having to do certain jobs. If you're linking it to anything in your ledger, you're actually qualifying data as, as an asset. Yeah, and that's, and that's I think, the valuation question. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, thank you. Um, the second question was for Lisa and a quick one uh, there. Is how do you see the, um, uh, the, the, the topic of context of data in relation to the truth of data? So you've got to, if you're looking at it from one person's context, it needs a certain level of accuracy, okay. what it, whereas a different person may look for a different context of that data. How do you see that being resolved? I think that's my point of getting these product teams together. So the people who are trying to look at it from a particular lens, using that lens in the way that, you know, what are the questions I need to answer? How accurate do I, do I need that information to be? How often do I want to understand that information? And building a product that serves that specific purpose um, because we're never going to solve the problem of trying to create the single source of truth otherwise. Because to your point, there's too many different perspectives we're trying to solve for. Before we go uh, in the front, <clears throat> a question from online. If you facilitate user-specified generated search programs, how do we prevent um, seeking combinations of data that can be essentially misusing the data for malicious purposes or for the wrong purpose inside an organization? By building strong CDR practices within your organization, <laughs> that question. Um, which it, it is. It's about building integrity around what you're doing. Um, I think this is one of the things, when I sit and reflect on this, it's interesting because as academics, we often feel like we're slow-moving beasts because we love put a lot of onus on doing ethical practice and research, and that's not to say people like KBMG don't do that. They absolutely do. But a lot of businesses are just doing, right? You're not actually, you're not invested in the research and the rigour of the research and the rigour of how you use data and how you capture that data, how you label that data, how you put, you write up about all the qualifications around that data. And so it's very well evidence. If someone picks up my data set, they know exactly where I got it from. They know who I got it from. They know how I used it. They know my inferences from it. And it's up to them then to take that data and interrogate it in the way, understanding how I've actually captured that data. And that's not being evident within organisations. And so the more that we make that clear, um, the better off it will be. All right. A question for uh, Dr. Nicole. <laughs> So Anthony <laughs> Coleman from GWI as of Monday the 14th. Um, so it's around, uh, you talked about the uh, digital transformation in the health space in particular, and uh, you talked about how there was um, appetite and aptitude around, um, you know, data transformation for human purposes rather than just for commercial purposes, which of course makes me sad. Um, <laughs> So I, I was keen to understand and sort of explore um, what that conversation looked like, you know, with, with hospitals and, and healthcare and around the, you know, the focus of, you know, the types of challenges that they're looking to overcome beyond we'd like to, you know, increase revenues from X amount to Y. Yeah, I mean, I think, Anthony, hospitals are different to other players in the field. If you look at anyone who's got a commercial revenue model, pharmaceuticals, et cetera, et cetera, I'll pick on them. Um, yeah, they're very much focused on bottom line dollars, et cetera, getting that back in. But if you look now, what's been really refreshing for me over the last couple of, probably years, couple of years now um, with hospitals in particular is them talking about, they do talk about it, oh good, we don't have to, we won't have to invest in so many staff to then be able to look after so many patients but their conversation is turning a bit in terms of, well, we actually want people to be well. Our actual priority now is well-being and wanting people to actually be well. And they understand then that that means probably lower costs for them, like money coming into their organisations, but they're going back to their original gender, which is to keep health populations healthy. Um, at the same time, they're just shifting their strategic focus to let's, people are still going to get sick. <laughs> um, but we'll look after them in the way that best suits them rather forcing them into a system that we've had, an ecosystem that we've had set up where you have to, every time you're here, you come and get well here. You can't get well in your home. You can't get well anywhere else. Um, I think they're understanding that that customer centric approach that we see time and time again is a really strong call and it's just getting stronger because we now have access over all our data too. And we're going into our doctors now and going, I have this, you better give me this medication and I want this and I want this treatment, et cetera. So it's the actually responding. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, 
one one question, and I think you were talking about KPIs of organizations. One question online came: How does an ethical KPI for an organization look like? <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think there are practices you can put in place, um, which is around ensuring that the processes um, are, are set up. Like, so the KPIs are not necessarily how, how many times did you not discriminate against somebody within your data set. It's actually rewarding people in a way that says, you know, we actually have um, done a project, it actually has resulted in X, Y, and Z. And a part of that reporting process is the fact that we're, we're, we can pretty much maybe put a, a guarantee or a 90 95% confidence level around the fact that you know, the data that we've collected has not been coerced from our customers because we've done this approach and this approach. Um, so it's actually those indicators that you can put into your reporting that help in that way. A, a quick one for Lisa uh, before we go to the question here. Uh, has the design mesh actually been adopted by an organization successfully? I do. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would say certainly, and I, we have been adopting elements of it already into organizations. So. I can't talk about it, um, unfortunately, um, still confidential pieces, but absolutely. And I mean, I, I think the concept of um, product-centric design and product-centric development is not new, human-centered design. We just need to adopt some of those practices into how we're building, you know, reports and, and, and informa information that's and dashboards that are built in our organisations and making sure um, that they're purposeful, that they're, they're they're answering the key questions that pe the people who are consuming those reports want answered. Um, that's a very, I would think, a relatively easy step to um, take back to your organisations in terms of where are we focusing our efforts, um, what, what reports are in the pipeline, how are we triaging, how we prioritise those even. Um, so. All right, very good. Please. Thank you. Yeah, Blake Barrett from Defence in Business. Thank you very much, Nicole and Lisa. My question uh, revolves around some of the history in terms of um, when I was listening to the presentation, I was thinking data, information, knowledge, wisdom, uh, and, and about the history in terms of paradigms and, and new ways of looking at things. Is, is, is some of that information from the past and that heritage that we've got still quite useful as a, as a basis for data? Because quite often I feel, even though I might be a technical person and I like data, quite often the leadership don't really, they do try to understand, but it really is quite a fanutia of understanding the data. So I'm just, I'm just my question's about the leadership in terms of how they might really get into the data or do they never get into the data? I think you picked up on a really interesting, because the, the more I read into this and the more, particularly when I'm looking at it from that management level insights, particularly when you're looking at how to create good CDR practice, it does come down to, um, you know, the wisdom, like what, what's the end goal here? What's the end understanding? And it usually is the wisdom, the thing that is the thing that someone's going to hang their hat and go, this is the thing that we do. And then we do it because of all these reasons. Um, so the more that we can link our data to good insights, to good decisions, the decisions that make impact, um, that to me is a chain of, you know, so here's good data, here's good knowledge, and then there's good wisdom. Um, yeah, I think you've, that's absolutely a way to frame that moving forward. All right. Lisa, did you want to add to that? Oh, look, I would say, I mean, I, I think senior leadership generally understand that data is valuable, but I don't think they appreciate the, the investment that's required to put the foundations in place so that you, you can do, you can get get some real value, um, but, you know, and, and, it's, and it's getting them to invest in those foundations, but, you know, equally, you know, how do we show value quickly? Um, and so getting that product team to set up and, and produce a report that shows them that we're now getting the answers we didn't have before. Uh, and and those, those value drops whilst you're building foundations is really critical to that stakeholder buy-in. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm sorry, we're running out of time. I'm gonna, gonna close it here. We've got a couple of questions online. We've got a couple of questions in the room. In the room, we're gonna probably be able to, to continue the discussion with the speakers. Um, um, once we finish, but I, I want to give the people online also a chance to to prepare for a state of origin. So, 
<laughs> so let us let us please uh, thank thank our speakers. <laughs> And we've got a little little present for you, Lisa. And Nicole, as usual, you get our gratitude. I yes. <laughs> I'll share it with you. Yeah. <laughs> if you want, to, please. All right. If this has sparked your interest, um, talking about data, we're actually uh, starting a new a master degree in business analytics. So this is your opportunity to actually come to a seminar. And, 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 and learn more a little bit more about this. And probably related to that, we also have a, a master in cybersecurity where we're talking about cyber leadership. So anybody interested in that, you can also come to us and actually learn a little bit more about that. And the, the other topic that I want to promote here before we close it is our alumni, alumni mentoring platform. UQ has 290,000 alumni. So if you're a UQ alum, you're actually part of, of a very strong network. And uh, you get exclusive UQ mentoring and peer coaching um, if you actually come to us, join us on this platform. There's a link on there. You can also talk to us afterwards. And we've got people in the room who can actually help you with the discussion. Anthea Barry and Fran Francesca Hawks, where are you? Over there and over there. The people with their hands up, you can talk to those people about this, get a bit more insight what we're actually doing there. With that, a little bit behind time, I want to say thank you. And uh, for the people in the room, join us for drinks. Let's thank our speakers again. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you.